the following is basically my experience with wild barred owls in the East Lake area. Um, I, I've been living in Pinellas County for 50 years plus, and during the period of 2010 and 2012 was, I had moved up into the East Lake area and I didn't see that many of these types of birds in the Southern portion of the county. So I felt like I had moved to literally Australia. Um, and I was very interested in the wildlife. I started with Audubon Eagle Watch and I monitor particularly around the outskirts of Lake Tarpon. Um, so I want to start by talking about barred owls because they are so numerous and there are lots of them at the Brooker Creek Preserve and in John Chestnut Park and in spots in between. Um, and I was uh, a rescuer and I would get calls, a lot of calls, and every call I was getting about, oh no, there's a dead hawk on East Lake Road, I would go out and check it. And 100% of the time, it had been barred owls between those dates of 2010 and 2012. So um, barred owls are absolutely gorgeous birds. This is a picture of a young one. And you can tell if you look at that photo, you'll see the um, downy head of the barred, B-A-R-R-E-D, the barred owl, and the solid black eyes that reflect the night of a very nocturnal owl species. They have that bright yellow beak. And then the front of them is actually barring. You don't see it on this baby because it's just simply all down, but they get a barred chest like this as you move forward. And that's how they got the name barred owl. They are a very interesting species because they live in uh, swampy type of areas and you can find them even at the edges of ponds trying to get crayfish or small things to eat right right out of a pond and so people don't always relate fishing line injuries to barred owls yet barred owls are often found alongside of ponds hanging from a wing because of fishing lines. So we always like to recommend to people that it, it's a good idea to, to make sure you uh, pick up your fishing line because it does not, not just shorebirds or seagulls, it's, it affects owls and it affects bald eagles. So um, we like to bring awareness of that topic with uh, the barred owl. Here's a couple of very cute babies staring back down at the photographer. I think this is in John Chestnut Park. Maybe. And here's a barred owl flying. And you can see that they have a very broad wing. And in this picture, this bird's tail is, expa is expanded. And you can see the bars basically along those tail feathers. And that's how you would recognize them. They have that very strong facial disc strikes me in this. Um, they have that very strong facial disc on most owls because they've got these round faces and their eyes. Like if, if, if you put your hands up to your eyes like this and you turn your head, you think about it, that owl's eyes are fixed in their head not like us humans that we can look up, we can look down. So their eyes are fixed in their head and that gives them the need to turn their head. So they have actually seven more vertebrae in their neck than, than we do. And they can turn their head 270 degrees. Um, there's only one species that can really spin its head all the way around and, and that's mothers. So. Now you have to laugh. Everybody has to laugh now at home, even just a little <laughs> chuckle. And they have mothers have eyes in the back of their head too. Um, but anyway, back to the barred owl. Um, here's the you know full picture of those bars and of the adult. Now they're not in the open that often, but when they are, owls 
other birds do not like owls and they will, crows will try and bombard them away. Little birds will try and bombard them away. So if you're walking almost anywhere, if you hear the birds around you, the ones that you're seeing making a lot of fuss, then you can look around and see if there's a predator about it. Could be anything from a bald eagle to a hawk, to an owl, to a gator, but they seem to make a special fuss about owls. So if you do um, hear that, look for one of these guys. Otherwise they're seen, you know, this is guys perched out in the day. This bird can be active in the day, although it's a nocturnal hunter. Um, when you're trying to look for an owl, it's kind of hard because usually it's at night. Usually they're not out in the open. So you have to listen for them. And the barred owl has a very special vocalization um, called whoops through and uh, I whoop whoo. Um, they make some other really, really strange vocalizations. And uh, if you go out in your backyard and you hear like there, you hear a bunch of crazy, like it sounds like you have a whole group of monkeys in your backyard. It's probably two barred owls. What they're doing, that's just their business. And, um, <laughs> but barred owls, uh, barred owls are, are interesting. And uh, I, I share this story with you. Um, with permission from a birder friend named Bob. He says in a post, this evening I stopped on my way home to try to pick up a screech owl for my monthly county list. I played a recording for a minute or two, then listened for a response. When owling, I always try to be cognizant of potential hazards. These typically include looking for snakes, bears, and coyotes. Tonight, after hearing no response and needing to relieve myself, I began to do so and turned the recording on again. I heard a screech owl begin to respond softly from the woods behind me. As I turned in that direction, something large and heavy slammed into the side of my face. <laughs> I never heard it coming and could not locate it after, but I believe it was a barred owl. The impact was hard enough to stun me slightly and I have a couple of minor talon punctures. It hurt enough to make me decide to give up and go home. By that time, there were two screech owls possibly laughing at me. <laughs> so a great story that he wrote about an, uh, an encounter with a wild barred owl and barred owls and owls in general are very stoic and they, they kind of just they sit there, oftentimes they're solitary. Um, you know, there's been reports from all over the country about owls that actually have hit people. There was one out of the Carolinas in particularly, it was on CNN or something like that. And there was a jogger and she was getting hit by the owl in the morning. And when I saw the video, I, I thought I could tell exactly why the owl was hitting her. She had a very nice little ponytail up here. And when she ran, it was bouncing like a bunny rabbit. And I think that they thought it was a rabbit and tried to, tried to grab it. Um, and that would have been, uh, you know, obviously a mistake on the part of the owl. But they could have, she could also be running directly by a nest and the owl was defending the nest. So um, you do need to be, cautious about them. I try to avoid labels because they're not aggressive birds. They are protective of their nests and they're predators. Just like all birds of prey, it's going to be, I'm either a predator right now or I'm a prey right now. And um, that's how they live. So unfortunately, um, the number one trauma in a study uh, for uh, birds of prey. It came out of the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey, not the photo, but the study, um, actually showed about 44% of, of the bird of prey mortality is due to being hit by a car. And this bird um, was hit and the wing snapped practically off. And what happens is the, they try to fly in roadways at night to catch rodents that are crossing or they fly, like screech owls will fly around lighting um, to catch moths. 
So always try and keep up your awareness even at night. It's just not natural for us to think, uh oh, I might hit a bird because we, we are not necessarily thinking about owls. We're thinking about cardinals or something. And at night, here's, you know, the, the owls are out and um, they are absolutely looking for dinner and sometimes in the wrong place in a roadway. This guy got patched up quite well. This owl had a broken leg. I don't know if you can see that it's out of place there, but it's turning the wrong direction. So it is, uh, yeah, we have a bird that's similar, but this was not even salvageable. So, and this was one that we got to release. So it's nice to see them go free. And it's almost immediately that you can hear another barred owl calling when you release a barred owl. So. There's a lot of good environment for them, uh, especially, I would say, especially in North County, because we have Brooker Creek Preserve, that is the only forest we have here in Pinellas County. And then we have some nice parks, John Chestnut and Anderson and, um, and such. And this was actually taken in the East Lake area at one of the farms where we let the bird go. That a lot of them, this is how I would find them and they would be hit by a car and didn't make it. Now for Eastern screech owls, and if, if Charlotte, you could actually queue up one of these screech owls. Um, Eastern screech owls are not the smallest of the owl species, but they're very small. They're often confused to be a baby great horned owl when it's really a, an adult Eastern screech owl. They, they don't vocalize the way barred owls do or barn owls or great horned owls or, or burrowing owls. That, those are the five species of owls that we actually find in Florida. The Eastern screech owl, if, if you could look it up on your device later is, uh, and, and you heard um, it about it in Bob's story, but it's a little trilling kind of sound. And it's like, and, they make little whinnying sounds that could often be mistaken for the lightest whinnying of a horse. So um, they don't actually have that deep. Ooh. Uh, Eastern screech owls uh, are very, very plentiful in Pinellas County. And um, this is a picture of one of the many, many babies that comes in. Pinellas County and Audubon bird counts uh, it, were counted more Eastern screech owls in Pinellas County than anywhere else. So we're kind of the screech owl capital here where we live. They're all in oaks, they're in pines, they're in palms, they're fine little crevices in, in uh, pagodas outside. They like to take nesting boxes. Um, and sometimes the babies um, get displaced. So it would not be unusual if the bird's unable to be renested for um, the licensed rehabilitators in the area to actually raise these screech owls and they put them together and they will often play screech owl sounds and make sure that they grow up so they are releasable, um, releasable birds. But this is what they look like prior to really opening their eyes up. I was gonna put him on that one. Yeah, one. No, don't get down. <laughs> Here's a couple of siblings that had been displaced. They're awfully cute when they're babies and they have a lot of down. They all, you know, one of the things we really love about Screech Owls here at Robinson Lake is we like the looks on their faces because they all seem to have a di little slightly different look and a slightly different personality. The bird on the right here is very sleepy and if he was one of the seven dwarfs, I might've called him grumpy. And then we have Scooter um, over here on the other screen. That's one of our resident street gels and Scooter is one of our program birds. Here was a group of seven of them that went down to, at the time they went down to save our seabirds and then they were returned and released.
This is a picture at Moccasin Lake Nature Park. And this is vintage. This is Gary Doyle. And he was one of our volunteers quite a long time ago with um, a bird we no longer have. That's actual bird's name is Wiki. And this is, it's amazing because I'm looking very closely at the picture and I'm seeing our old kitchen in the background. And we have a completely, the city of Clearwater built us a complete raptor care center here. So it looks very different now than it did in the old days. Here's some screech owls in a palm tree and what happens, and this is another thing that we like to raise public awareness about for owls. Um, palm trees, when they're in these palm trees, a lot of people trim the palm trees. And sometimes that's actually, it's really sad. I'm, this is, I'm gonna tell you a sad thing, but sometimes they get hit by the saw. So that, that, that it's usually not recoverable, but, but they usually stop by the time they realize and then call someone. So what happens a lot of times is the, there's a variety of rescue groups that come out. We have Boy Scouts, for example, build owl boxes that we'll give to people that need to have an owl re-nested. Um, so that's very helpful because at least these birds go into an owl and they can stay with their parents and be raised by their parents. That's a great goal to have because you want um, them to stay wild because owls do uh, uh, and can imprint and humanize um, on people. This is a little owl that actually, I, I think he's still alive, but um, this is an owl that was found um, inside, this is a, I believe this is a Honda engine and this is Honda Palm Harbor. And one of the mechanics brought his truck into the shop to work on it. And he said, when he opened up the um, engine, he found the screech owl. So this bird, unfortunately had a broken wing. It may have been hiding in there. It may have broken its wing in there, but um, he went to live at um, Largo, um, the Narrows Park, another place where you can find a treasure trove of birds. The, uh, the Eastern screech owl, comparing it to the barred owl, we've looked at two species so far. So the Eastern screech owl had tufts on top of its head and so do great horned owls, they're eared owls. The barred owl and the barn owl do not have ear tufts. So they are not eared owls. Owl's ears are actually located on each side of their head and one's higher and one's lower. So, and that's true of, of, of all the owls. And they have incredible hearing. And that facial disc helps sound travel into their ears so that they can locate prey, so that they really have some amazing superpowers. Great horned owls have 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in their feet. So they should really, you have to be, if you find one of these, call, call a rescue because they know how to handle these guys and they have thick gloves. They're, they're very, very strong birds. They, I mean, really thick, big, this isn't even that, like big yeah, ones. This is the one. There we go. This is the, this is our owl glove. And we have, um, our owl's name is Lulu, our great horned owl. And she's been known to take this glove away from us and the other two we had. And, and so <laughs> very powerful is my point. And if you look at this bird's eyes, like the screech owl, it differed from the barred owl. These guys have a light colored eye and they actually can do some hunting at dusk and at dawn. And, and actually birds of prey or raptors are opportunists. So honestly, if you're hungry and you see something good to eat, you can take it. And especially if you're a great horned owl. This is a gorgeous photograph that was taken by my friend Kathleen Finnerby. And um, you can really see the ear tufts in the eye in this. And look at the strong beak to boot. Plumicorns. plumicorns, that's exactly right. Those tufts are called plumicorns. That's a great Halloween word. What are you going to be? Plumicorn, I'm plumicorn. That would be a great costume for twins. We have two plumicorns. Yeah, <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, we had, we saw this greatest picture last night 
of little bags of candy that had been, and they were candy corn, and they were put in a little bag sideways, and they said bird beaks on it. So that was pretty cute. So plume of corns, that's how you can remember that one. Oh yeah, here's a couple more gorgeous birds. They, um, they have their plume of corns down so they can patrol those, by the way. And if something alerted them, their, eye, their plume of corns would go boing straight up. And this little guy has just had a meal. And you can tell because there's some blood on his face. Um, but you can also look at this picture and see the camouflage that owls have. So on top of them being mostly, you know, either nocturnal or mostly active at night, they blend right into the tree. They blend right into the background. If I was out there birding, what would have alerted me to this would have probably been the white spot of the baby. And um, they look like a screech owl baby, but bigger. Um, and so. You know, it's hard to, hard to tell the difference except for, when they're, except for size. A screech owl baby fits in the palm of your hand. A great horned owl baby is going to start small, but it's going to be, be at least two hands. So they're bigger. And of course, they get much, much, much larger. Um, what's Lulu's weight? Ooh. We're going to look up the weight of our, our, our great horned owl for you and tell you that. Couple more little babies in that little nook. 1420. Yeah. So um uh 1420 grams. Three, four pounds. Mm -hmm. Now, beside and, and what do they take with these strong grip that they have? Anything they want. You know, oh, this is the this is one of the most beautiful screen, uh, uh, great horned owls I have ever seen. Um, I think that this bird has the prettiest face. I just love looking at this picture and you can see all that pine woods in the background and they're not gonna nest in a box. They're not gonna, gonna nest in a cavity. Great horned owls don't even build nests. They take them. They take them from, and their success depends on who they take them from. Primarily they take them from bald eagles. So what we see in our county is we see a bald eagle nest be built and a great horned owl move in. And then that's exactly when the bald eagle moves out to another location. And those two nesting habits are very correlated. The bald eagle and birds of prey were greatly diminished by DDT, DDE, went on to the endangered species list. And through millions of dollars of public contributions, the Endangered Species Act worked and it brought back bald eagles and peregrine falcons and ospreys and hawks, et cetera. And as this recovery has taken place, it simply means that there was more bald eagles and more ospreys. That means they're building this city in the sky there is a landscape in the sky over pinellas county i think of it as an overlay just it's just the bird overlay <laughs> but um they um they will take right away the bald eagle's nest because the more nests that are built well these great horned owls have a lot of real estate choices when they're out shopping and so that is the nature that they have is to take the nest. And they'll take an osprey nest, they'll take an eagle nest, some of them will take a hawk nest or a crow nest, but I can tell you almost always when they do that, their babies end up on the ground. And that happens, call a rescue, they'll put up a platform, they'll put the babies back and hopefully have them be uh, raised also by their parents, especially these guys. And um, so it this is an osprey platform. This bird took a platform that was built originally by an osprey. So they, they also off season when the great horned owl is not nesting, they, they're, they're usually uh, birds of prey are pretty solitary, but they might be just in any old woodlot. And then comes October 
and migration starts. And there's all these other birds, ospreys, peregrine falcons, that have to stop in some little woodlot to rest for the night before they go on. Some of them will fly through, but some of them will rest. And when they do that, they um, it would be kind of like a hummingbird flying into the web of a spider. Um, because if they have gone and landed into that great horned owl's lot, especially juvenile ospreys, um, the great horned owl will take the bird. We have um, actually recovered um, ospreys that had satellite trackers on them that had been attacked by great horned owls. And you can tell the only thing that was left was the wings and the transmitter. There he is. That's a good looking one too. Yeah. I don't know if you can find the owl in this one. It's right in the crook of the tree. This bird in particular, I believe this is the old nest at Fort DeSoto. And that bird had, uh, had an eye problem. She eventually got entangled in fishing line and she was rehabilitated by the Raptor Center of Tampa Bay. Nancy Murrah got that bird, did a wonderful job, and we were able to release the bird back at Fort DeSoto and really glad because she's iconic there. And uh, hopefully she's back again this year. Now, when you have to put an owl back up into a nest that was built maybe by an eagle, maybe by an osprey, um, you usually have to utilize a tree climber. So it's time consuming and difficult, but it can be done. And you can see the hard hat is a necessity because you do not want to be hit in the head by a great horned owl. This was the little kid that was going back up in that day. I'm gonna go back to this picture again. Um, just so you know, the gentleman there on the right that is climbing is an arborist and a trained climber. Um, his name is Art Finn and he was the former arborist in the city of Dunedin and then at the city of Safety Harbor. And um, he helped actually put owls and eagles back in nests um, for many years. Now this owl is not a happy camper and we'll see. Why? Because we're trying to get its bird back, its baby back to it. <laughs> and we did get the bird back up there. And what you'll notice is you can see the legs of the climber and you see all the groceries I left. Look at all of those rats. I, we put those up there for the owls um, so that they wouldn't even have to stress over having to catch food with their baby back. And so I'm sure that they did really well with that. And uh, some of the tree climbers get funny and they pose the mice, but I'm sure the bird was well fed. Oh, I love this bird. Um, this is a picture of a bird named Franklin who lives at the Narrows in Largo. And um, he was um, found on a large tract of land with a terrible, terrible wing injury. I'm sorry, I'll go back. Um, and actually he had to have um, an amp a partial amputation, but he was taken in by um, the Narrows and he lives in an enclosure there with another great horned owl that I had rescued named Eleanor, Franklin and Eleanor. They're great names. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the barn owl. Now, B-A-R-N, B-A-R-N, barn, instead of bard. Um, it's so hard to get those um, when, you're, when you're speaking, especially over this. So it's B-A-R-N for this white, ethereal, ghost-looking bird. Um, the great horn owl, I'll backtrack one second. The great horn owl, its vocalization is different. It's whoo, whoo, real deep. I can't even get that deep. Ooh, ooh. There you go. She's doing it. Charlotte's got it for us. And then there's the barn owl. And, you know, they call the Eastern screech owl, screech owl, but they don't screech. Barn owls not only screech, they shriek. They get hiss. They make also these crazy vocalizations. 
And here was a couple of babies. These went to the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. This was, again, back in that time frame. But these guys had hatched um, in, uh, they were in a uh, marina out towards St. Pete Beach. And they are probably, I guess you would call them the predecessors. They had ancestors that nested many, many years ago, probably in the 60s. I'd have to look up the date, but in the Stetson um, uh, College of Law Tower. And so these barn owls have managed to, to make it through these years. Um, but the barn owl, unlike the great horned owl increasing in population, screech owl, I said, we have number one practically in the country that I, I don't think there's anything more than that. And then um, barred owls, I said, we're numerous. There are some in South County, but many in North County because we have some, uh, we have woods here. And uh, then you have the barn owls and they've been almost extirpated which is driven out of basically of the county. They're, they're, I doubt there's more than 10 pair. Um, uh, they sometimes are called bridge birds because sometimes they'll nest up underneath even the interstate. Um, and they're a global species. They're the only owl we've talked about today that can be found all over the world. And it has multiple uh, subspecies and some are small and some are browner. It depends on which country or area of the world you're in. Um, they have a heart-shaped face, facial disc, and uh, I'm hoping this video is going to play, so I'm going to give it a shot. No. Maybe I have to. Yeah, I might have to go out of the presentation. I might do that last for you. Just go back and get that sound, or Josie might make the sound. So, um. You can look at Joe for a moment. That's the barn owl that you're seeing on the other screen. And he has his, he's holding his foot up. And his, uh, it's called a foot pump. And it's a sign of relaxation. He's just basically, he's chilling. And he's got this facial disc. And he's got this like split that goes down like this of feathers. And in that, all of that is also guiding sound into the barn owl's ears. Of all animals tested, barn owls have the best hearing. So they can actually um, reach down into three feet of snow or grass to reach down and grab their prey out. They have very, like, Long, they have broad, actually broad, round wings. And like the other owls, they have a serrated edge that allows them to fly silently. Owls in particular, barn owls in particular, need to be able to fly at low elevation. Great horned owls too, because they got to pick up their prey. Great horned owls are the only one that can, can pick up a greater um, weight, okay? These guys have high energy. They have to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, trip after trip. They could eat their weight in mice every night. Unlike their other counterpart owls here, here in Florida, okay? Unlike their counterparts, these guys nest multiple times per year. And they can have many babies in that brood, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. Ton of kids in their nest. They have tons of them. And they have to feed each one of those four or five mice a night to raise them. So that is a lot, a lot of trips that they're making back and forth. Well, that's incredibly beneficial for people. So what we found with the barn owl is that they are being used in the Everglades agricultural area to reduce, and it's working to successfully reduce rodent populations, as well as in the vineyards in California. They protect 
the rodent. They, they protect from rodents. This is a better technique for human beings to use than using rodenticide. That's probably the number two or close to, you know, the highest mortality for owls is secondary poisoning. And, and that affects everything, even kids and pets. So um, you find a lot of rodenticide around living centers, schools, uh, you know, industrial complexes. And when seen, we do try and approach organizations to build awareness of rodenticide and secondary rodenticide poisoning by making sure they get the type of rodent box that the animal does not come back out on the other side, goes in, pre-poison, comes out poison, and once it's out, that poison's in the environment, period. And these guys, they get very thirsty when they're poisoned, so do the rats, because a lot of those poisons actually um, work by um, blocking uh, their uh, ability to clot blood. And so they start bleeding internally and they get very thirsty in the process. So if you see an animal that's by a pond and not leaving the pond, just staying there because it's drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking, it, it could be poison. It's possible that it's poison. So, and these guys, they like to nest in these high and dry marinas. Um, they can be found on billboards. I said bridges already. Um, what else do, is there anything else about barn owls? What else do you want to say about barn owls? They're, they're long. A global raptor. Yeah, they're a global raptor. And they, they because they fly low, they, the barn owl has, look at how extra long the leg is in that photograph and on our bird, you can see one leg up and one leg down and it's a pretty long leg and it stretches so they can reach deep down into grasses. So loss of habitat is also a huge problem for these because they need separating the spatial distance right now. Yeah, is he? Oh, he stopped. Okay. I said it and he stopped. They yeah. can separate and it's just the ground in there, but that's the, all those feathers make their hearing all that yeah. much more accurate with their asymmetrical ears. Yeah. And even though we don't have a ton of barn owls left in Pinellas County, there are plenty of barn owls in Florida, but um, utilizing boxes is a great thing to do. And I find it so interesting when thinking about the barn owl, we have a lot of different species at Moccasin Lake. And one of the other species that we have is peregrine falcon, which is another global raptor. And um, both the peregrine falcon, the barn owl, and then another type of bird, the osprey, those are global raptors. They're found all over the world. And all three of those species have adapted to nesting on man-made structures. So um, they can and will learn to live among us, but we have to encourage every, every property owner from the smallest to the largest property to manage property responsibly so that we have a bird-friendly community. Okay. I'll bring that up last. I'll take it out of the slide view. These are the burrowing owls. And we did used to have burrowing owls in St. Petersburg. Um, but uh, that was out at, I think, Al Lang Stadium. Um, they can be found around the edges of airports. There are some populations up in Trinity uh, off of Powerline Road. And then there's quite a lot of them down to the south of here. And they really do burrow um, in the ground and they make little burrows and they live in those. Um, they're one of the most expressive looking owls. And if you look at them, they look so much like a screech owl, but there's something missing. What's missing? The plumicorns. So you know it's a burrowing owl if there aren't any plumicorns. And um, there is a big festival uh, down in Sanibel. It's the Burring Owl Festival every every year. They, I don't know if they're still holding it, but they will, I'm sure, hold it again if they have paused it for COVID. But, um, but it's a great festival. I highly recommend you go um, to the Burrowing Owl Festival. These guys are very cute. They're very expressive. Not, but as I said, not too many of them here. 
Um, here's some of the captive owls at McGow. We've talked about them. This is some of the uh, types of enclosures that we put them in. This is a different park than I'm at. This is one that I worked with prior to coming to Moxon Lake. And we have a lot of times Boy Scouts to build the enclosures for these birds. So they have special, what they call a keeper spot that can go in. You have a two door system because you don't want your owl to escape. So you go in through that and then go into the enclosure. That's Franklin. When, and this is when, he, on the left was when he was very first rescued. These were his x-rays. He was taken to Bush Gardens. Oh, I guess let's say it's a pen, not an amputation. Um, but I can see this was in March of 2012. And what you can notice about it is the, not just the pen, but if you look at the uh, image on the right, you can see how much real estate the eyeballs of owls actually takes up. They're really, is a, it's, a, it's got a large socket, they have really big eyes. And you can see the pen. That looks like it still had, it probably had an external fixator mm -hmm. on it and yeah, had not sure. been removed, yeah, yeah. And this is Eleanor. I love this bird. Okay, you can see she has eye damage. Um, she came from the Fox Hollow Golf Course and um, she, I think had a fight with a bald eagle. And I think that in this case, that the bald eagle may have won and punctured the eyes. Um, it could have also been a fight with another owl or another bird of any kind. It could have been prey. Um, but in any case, uh, she was definitely down and was not going anywhere. So I actually grabbed her and um, she went to the Seaside Seabird Sanctuary. Um, and the thought at that time was this bird was like, when she was in small quarters, she's really, she was claustrophobic. She was acted like really wild and that we might have to put her down. But I, I noticed the opposite when she had room. So um, we, we did put her in at, at the Narrows, they call it the Narrows now. And she, um, and she did great in there. We, she, she took a piece of food by hand from the keeper the first day, top day wow. she was there. But she had room again and she didn't feel like trapped. Um, so, I mean, big birds need a lot of space even in captivity. So I know, I hope she's doing well down there. And this is Matilda. This far owl like, showed up on my doorstep one morning with, it was, I think it was in a beer box or something. And I think another re a rehabber put it there. I didn't know that or a rescuer put it there. And then I took um, her down to Seaside Seabird Sanctuary. She had a droop wing. And um, she also lives at the Narrows. She was transferred from Seaside Seabird Sanctuary over to the Narrows. She's a beautiful bird. I always, I always loved Matilda. And last of all, there's the fruit owl. If you really want to make an owl out of fruit for Halloween, you can. This one is all dressed up. They've even got some great um, anklets and jesses on this fruit owl. So I, um, I like to thank everybody that contributed to this program and for the work with the owls in that time period. I've listed them here. Um, all of these people have donated those photographs to bring this to you. And I thank you for joining the program. And we would like to now go live showing you all of our different owls and uh, you can meet them up close and personal. So or as up close and personal as we can get. All right. Ready for, this is Joe. Yeah. Yep. Joe, I, I told them about Joe being rescued by a dog. Mm -hmm. And now I think we need a barred owl. I will do that. Okay. Charlotte is gonna go get a barred owl. And we'll show you the barn owl. Where did the, we showed the screech owl already? Yeah. Okay. You want Jerry to get Lulu? And then Lulu will come in. Oh. Yep. So pause for that. We can take questions in the meantime. Thank you so much, Barb. Uh, while you're getting your critters together, um, I could, if I wouldn't, uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you stop sharing your screen, we'll be able to see 
um, the owls as they come to visit you uh, in a larger Got it. frame. Wonderful. Yeah. There's Josie, of course. Uh, we had a couple questions, very good questions, as a matter of fact. So let's go ahead and, and get to some of those. Um, Dan, very early on, uh, loves owls, uh, as so does the 11-year-old daughter. And there's three different kinds in the neighborhood. And they would like to encourage owls or do whatever it is that they can to it, you know, to make sure that they've got a, a welcoming habitat around their house. Do you have any advice for that? I absolutely have advice for that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to talk about boxes a little bit. And here's my thing about boxes. I think they can use, be used very successfully, but they have to be monitored and they have to be cleaned. So one thing to encourage owls would be owl boxes. However, you could end up with anything in your box. So you can get bees, squirrels, and I, I started with an owl box and I think I ended up with bluebirds. So then I put out a bluebird box and the chickadees took the bluebird box. So, um, so my advice is never underestimate the value of a dead tree. Um, when there are broken limbs on things and, and leaving things a little messy is not a bad thing for owls. Screech owls, for example, how would that relate? Well, if I'm a screech owl, I'm flying around, I'm looking for leaf litter. And the reason I'm looking for leaf litter is because there are cockroaches in there and I like cockroaches. So yum, yum, we want screech owls around because they're gonna eat the cockroaches. Um, so that being said, you can um, leave things more natural, but besides that, I think, especially if, uh, as a homeowner, the most important thing we can do is on our own property is native plants because you will attract native species. That's it. Native plants attack, attract native species. So screech owls, for example, like to live in oaks. They blend in and camouflage with it that a lot. Um, and keep an eye on your property. I know there's a lady in Palm Harbor that has this arbor and above the arbor is a little roof. Well, believe it or not, there's enough space in there for the screech owl to get in there. So be mindful on your property um, for uh, any place that they may be nesting. And that's, that's what I would do to encourage them um, is native plants. I, I think that it is essential to their survival because in that it's providing some cover for other things, um, but those things are there anyway. Um, so the owls, you know, the owls can get in there too. And I, I know there's mice in my yard. I know there are. Uh, there's, you know, they could cross through. I don't have much lawn. My entire backyard is all natives. So I, I do hear owls come into the backyard sometimes, in particularly in my backyard, barred owl. So, um, and, and yeah, and my daughter's room is on the side of the oak. There's, there's a reason that she hears the owl because the tree is outside of her window. So trees are good to have oak trees are good to have, longleaf pine is good to have, but you have to be really careful with them because obviously root systems can, it can be too close to the house. So you have to be careful about that. I know that I have lifting in some areas of my home, but I really try not to take out trees and also um, try to tree trim in the uh, late, like August, September, um, even October, November, we, we have had screech owl babies come in as early as December. So um, even though it goes, it's usually not in December, but we have. So check your trees before you trim. Make sure you know what lives in your yard and then you got it. Does that, I hope that helps. I hope oh, that no, that's helps. great information. You, you, you encapsulated quite a lot of great information there. The importance of native plants, the importance of um, 
looking before you leap and, and inspecting mm -hmm. anything before you prune, pruning after the nesting season. That's all great stuff. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, I'm sorry. There's one more thing I didn't want to oh, forget yeah. about. At Halloween, if you would please not put spider web all over your yard. Owls do get stuck in it. Other birds get stuck in it. And, um, you know, there's a way to do it responsibly. You could put it up and take it right back down, like if you're having a party, you know, um, and have it for a very short period, few hours, whatever, but take it back down immediately. I don't even like to see a bug get trapped into it because the birds need the bugs. Yeah, but so don't use that spider webbing. It's really not good for the environment and for the habitat for the birds. The, the fake plastic webbing uh, filament stuff. Yeah, I see what you're talking about. Thank you for that. Um, early on when you were sharing Bob's story about um, playing the recording and, and listening for a, a response, uh, that got some attention. And uh, could you just speak to um, whether or not it's a good idea to play recordings to attract birds and uh, that it even led to a question, you know, is there a device that you can use to call owls in and is that really such a good idea? Um, okay, so if I wanted to get owls to come into my yard, the other thing I would use is a water bath. I am not a huge fan of using a device. Now in Bob's story, he was doing, trying to do a count and I know some people do use them. I think it's an app that you can put on your phone. Cornell so University. you can go to Cornell and look up any vocalization and just play it. I personally don't do that because I just don't like to disturb them. I don't wanna disturb them. So, um, yeah, I would put, if I wanted to see them, I'd put a bird bath out because even I get pictures from people. I wish I had one. Someone has to send me one, but even barred owls will get in a bird bath. They love taking baths. So mm -hmm. you can hang, a, you can, there's little mini ones that you can hang up from an eave and put a nest, like a ring on it. And then you could see if you're, what you're getting, use your ring. I had mine on my hummingbird feeder. Very, very cool. Now, of course, we had the question, and I'm sure it's on a lot of people's minds, how could someone uh, come and bask themselves in your expertise? How could someone come and be a volunteer with you and, and share in the care and um, uh, sharing the knowledge of, of these wonderful, wonderful birds? Okay, so um, the way to volunteer, come and visit us anytime, um, Tuesday through Sunday. From 10 to 5, you stop into the main office. Um, all of our volunteers are volunteers that are registered volunteers for the city of Clearwater. And um, there's, uh, or you can also go to our website, which is Moccasin Lake Raptor Sanctuary.org. And uh, there's how to volunteer on there because uh, you can just click a link to, it's so easy. You can click a link to get from there to the city paperwork and you just fill it out with the city it goes through an approval process definitely come in introduce yourself to us let us know that you filled out your paperwork and then we'll uh we can start working together um the birds need care every single day and are dependent a hundred percent on volunteers and we love to have volunteers so just come on in and visit us or check our website um and it's really it's a really simple process well, thank you for that. And and just a reminder to the folks that are with us this this morning, uh, the link that link is posted very early on in the chat. So if you want to uh, scroll up through the chat that that's uh, live this morning, uh, you can get right to that site. So uh, one more question um, uh, from Stephen: uh, Are there really enough rodents out there to support all these wild owls? He doesn't see any. Is he so, just lucky? <laughs> I'm really glad that, yeah, that's a great question. I love it. Are there enough rodents to support all these owls? And, okay, so they don't only eat rodents. All right, so your great horned owl is going to be eating rabbit. It eats other birds, um, probably anything you'd give it. Um, so it has diversity. The barred owl is going to be eating crayfish, snakes. They can catch a bat even. And so, so um, there's diversity in their diet. 
Now, are there really enough rats? Yeah, there are enough rats. There's enough rats. There's enough poison. I hear it. When I hear it, I hear it from city council members that get complaints from the public about rats. And we have to keep our garbages really secure. Keep your garbage secure um, and just let the rat go around the garbage so the owl can get it. But there are enough rats and the more people there are, I have a feeling that you know how that the great harnell and the eagles and the osprey as their population goes up uh the others go up that might be the relationship between people and rats i don't know but it sure seems like um there are plenty out there i know i get calls from people that have said oh i rats at my bird feeder oh yeah of course they were there before the bird feeder was ever there um and they're you know coming out at night and you know a lot of times to see them at night, you can take your bird feeder in at night or uh, bird feeders have to be cleaned a lot. And you don't want mold on them and because birds land on the same perches and if the perch is dirty, they can transfer disease from one to the other, cross contamination kind of thing. So, um, you know, I take a little bird seed now uh, and this is for songbirds, not for owls. Don't feed the, the birds of prey, it's illegal. Um, so don't try and place a mouse somewhere, but you can do bird seed. And I put it in the crook of a tree or at the end of a, a top of a post. And I just did mostly away with bird feeder. I don't have to worry about that. I just put it in areas too where the bird doesn't become a target of a hawk or an owl either. So that's how I handle um, the bird feeding on, and on my property. You have to think like a bird. Yeah, that's exactly it. You have to think like a bird. And you have to know that the rats and the snakes and the coyotes and the alligators are all already out there. So, like, you know, like I said, Florida is, a, is the Australia of the United States. We have all this wildlife. And um, the best thing is just be really sensitive of it. Well, we're certainly very lucky that you and your team are, are doing the wonderful work that you do helping to rehabilitate the injured owls. Um, what advice could you give us if we should encounter uh, an injured bird of, play, bird of prey right. raptor or, or really any other, any other bird? Uh, what's the first step that you would recommend that we take? Okay, so it's okay. So we rescue birds, but we don't rehabilitate them here at Moccasin Lake. We have all the all the population here are birds that have been injured permanently, so they need permanent care for the rest of their life. But call a bird rescue group, no matter or, or you know if, if it's a bird. We have Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue. We'll pick up raptors, and then we immediately get them to the rehabbers. Um, so that's the best thing to do is if you can contact a licensed wildlife rehabilitator, that's the best thing to do, um, is get them into the hands of people that know what they're doing with the bird. Um, sometimes it takes a while. It, it doesn't matter how many groups of rescues there are out there. It's still hard to answer all the calls in this urban area it would not be uncommon for just one group to see seven or 800 birds a year. So the numbers are high. We live here with all of this water, Tampa Bay, Gulf of Mexico, Lake Magore, Lake Seminole, Lake Tarpon, Antelope River, and we just, Pinellas County is rich with wildlife. You know, so call just, yeah. It, it, and, and we often, We'll help any animal if you call, we'll, if it's a raccoon, we'll give you the number you call for raccoons. I don't have a rabies shot, I don't handle raccoons. So you gotta get the right person. And um, there's in the Northern portion of Pinellas, Owl's Nest Sanctuary, Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue, uh, the uh, Seaside Seabird Sanctuary, um, and then Penny Bone is the rehabber that I work for, which is separate from this. Um, and then there's the Raptor Center of Tampa Bay, Nancy's group in Hillsborough County. And there is the awesomest, most wonderful group called Birds and Helping Hands and a special call out to my friend Shelly for the great work that she does uh -huh. getting all types of birds picked up and getting them to where they need to go. Well, that's wonderful. 
<clears throat> Great information. Thank you so much. I'll put a link to Birds and Helping Hands in the chat. But it looks like we've got some we've got some owls with something to say here now. We do. We have um, we oh this one is Clem, um, and Clem came to us um, from Gainesville area of Florida. He was living at, I think it's called Eagle Eye Sanctuary with a wonderful veterinarian, Dr. Dr. Dawn Miller. And um, she uh, had a lot of owls come in and this one was missing an eye. So we, this bird actually was rehomed, was used at Eagle Eye and then transferred here to Moccasin Lake um, as a you know permanent bird for the rest of his life. And I'll let Charlotte tell you a little bit about her dealings with Clem. The other owl that we have that is a barred owl, by the way, is Winston, and his injury is scissor beak. So you get a wide variety of reasons birds end up in captivity forever. Yep, Clem is a is a barred owl. I mean, you can tell that he uh, only has the one eye because uh, birds of prey tend to not have a very good sense of smell. Eyesight and hearing is critical for them to be able to hunt, which is one of the major reasons that a lot of birds missing an eye do end up needing to be, um, well, all of them end up needing to be uh, permanently uh, uh, in captivity. Um, he's been with us how long now? It's been at least four years. Yeah, and he's, he's pretty good. He's always happy to come out and educate the public. He's always a hit at the uh, birthday parties, community centers, education outreach programs that we do. Oh, yeah. um, he's, he's, also, he's a fantastic bird. He, did, he does a lot to teach people about owls and how we can help owls to have a He's successful. teaching about owls tomorrow, isn't he? He is. He will be here at the park uh, tomorrow from noon to five. We're having a small little Halloween celebration. We're going to pin the beak on the owls, some little goodie bags and candy, and of course, a chance to meet and learn about all the owls that do live here at the park. Yeah, it'd be, it's a great day to visit. It's gonna be a nice cool day tomorrow. There's a mile and a, a half of walking trails here. There's a turtle pond, there's a butterfly garden, and there are lots and lots of native plants. So it's wonderful. And we hope you all come and visit. We've just got another question in Good. from Anne, who'd like to know uh, any uh, bird sanctuaries, rehabs, um, or rescue, I would imagine, in Pasco County. Can you speak to any in Pasco County? Owl's Nest Sanctuary is the clo is one of the closest. And then you, uh, you've got Owl's Nest Sanctuary. And then further to the north, you have um, uh, Nature World. Mary Opal um, is the rehabber's name, Nature World. Um, so, but Pasco is, it's, it, it's, best served by Owl's Nest because they're in Odessa and they're the closest. Um, for raptors, I do go up into Pasco County. So um, my number's on our website. So if you have a raptor and you call me, we can, we have some reach up into Pasco. So we're Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue and uh, our number is online. Thank you, thank you. All right, and it looks like we're gonna queue up someone else. Who have we got next, do you know? I think we have Lulu. Yes, we do. Here comes Lulu. Now, I wanna tell you something. I don't particularly like naming wild birds. These are wild birds. They're trained, not tamed. And so I, I have trouble giving them names and I know along the way, volunteers have attached names to them. So Lulu came from the rehabber, but I, I always like to relate it, the name to some point of conservation or something about Florida. So I want you to know officially that there is a city in Florida named Lulu. There you have it. That's the Florida connection, the tiger of the sky, the apex predator, the great horned owl. <laughs> Ray, do you want to talk about Lulu? You can take your mask off. I'd rather you do. Okay. Oh, you want me to talk? Okay. Well, we've talked about um, the great horned owls, but um, this one, Lulu, I'll tell you, she um, she was a resident of Tarpon Springs, Florida, and she was rescued 
by a volunteer of one of the organizations that stopped here at Moccasin Lake. So we were the first humans that actually saw the little fluff ball that was Lulu. Lulu went to rehab and she was put in with other great horned owls and raised with the sounds. And yet Lulu still would not really like to take live prey. She liked her food room delivered. So she was tested and no, she's too habituated to let go. So she was coming to live here. I actually had her retested. I sent her to the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey because the owl that you're looking at physically has nothing wrong. She has beautiful plumic horns, beautiful eyes, great hearing, great beak. Feathers are in fine condition, bodies in top condition. Feet, no problems whatsoever, no injury whatsoever. It is a mental issue. I sent her to Audubon Center for Birds of Prey and had their rehabber, one of the best ever, Diana Flint, looked at this bird. And um, she also made, came to the same determination because I would not ever want to have a bird that's not non-releasable, not released. Um, so that's how Lulu came to be with us. And this is the bird, the kind of bird, the owl that I said that has 500 pounds of pressure per square inch in the feet. We have a picture of Lulu actually holding three of our gloves at one time because we were trying to change her ankles and just, and, and she's very, very powerful. She's very solitary. We have not been successful in, um, uh, having even put a mail with her because she's she's an imprint and they just don't do well. She thinks she's a person, and um, so she's not that the greatest disposition. So we really have to um, respect this one. And when she says no, we we accept that. <laughs> yep, and that would be um, Lulu. And any questions about Lulu? Oh, owls don't have crops. I can tell you that. So um, that's one thing that differs from other birds of prey, but their digestive system is interesting because they have kind of this dual digestive system where they have mechanic and enzymatic and whatever they cannot cough up, cannot digest that come out the end comes out as a pellet. And so we get these gigantic pellets from Lulu and tomorrow we'll be um, allowing to dissect some of those pellets here at Moccasin Lake. So, There'll be a table set up and you can check those out and put a brat back together. <laughs> Would you like to tell us again the, uh, oop. There goes Lulu. <laughs> yep. uh, would you like to remind us about the, the time and place for tomorrow's? Absolutely, 12 to five at Moccasin Lake Nature Park and we're located at 2750. Park Trail Lane in Clearwater. It's right in, it's right near Drew and 19. And when you're driving down US 19, you pass this little patch of green on, on the road and you, nobody really knows, oh, what, what is that? It's Moccasin Lake. And it's, um, it's really a very urban park because we're, we're a little over 50 acres that are nestled into an extremely dense area. That's great. Thank you. Thank right. you. We, we do not have any live questions. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Um, Barb, I really, really, really have to thank you again and again, not only for joining us this morning and, and telling us all about this wonderful group of birds, uh, but for everything that you do on behalf of not just the owls, but and not just the raptors, but all the wildlife and, and how everything fits together in, in our interesting and, and complex ecosystem that is our, our Pinellas County. Um, we're getting yeah. lots and lots of love in the chat. <laughs> Um, so really well done and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Everything we do for the birds is ultimately for the people. Thank all right. you. All right. Well, thanks okay. all for joining us. And, um, again, this presentation is being recorded. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. And so all the information that, that Barb has shared with us this morning and all the side links and everything like that, we will be sure to share with you. So. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. And as Thank always, um, 
do it for the wildlife. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>